Hello, I'm Diana North. I'm a general practitioner and I also work for the Good Fellow Unit. Today we're talking about the management of respiratory illnesses in children. We're lucky to have with us today Emma Best, who is an infectious diseases specialist working with children at the Starship, and Stephen Howie, who is a paediatrician at Waitemata District Health Board. Welcome both of you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Winter's coming, and there's been a lot of debate about the overuse of prescribing of antibiotics in children. Do you think we have an issue in New Zealand? I think there is information to show we have a high rate of community prescriptions. But importantly, most respiratory tract infections in childhood are actually viral and therefore don't need antibiotics. There's been much discussion about the wise use of antibiotics or stewardship of antibiotic use. Do you have any key principles that you should think about when prescribing antibiotics? Yes, I think that the key thing is to only use them when they're really indicated and then for the shortest effective course. We used to ask patients to take the lot, no matter what. Is this still right? If you've prescribed appropriately, then yes, they should finish the course. Now, if you're waiting for an investigation, say for instance a throat swab, and that's negative, then you can stop the antibiotics without finishing the course. I notice in the latest rheumatic fever guidelines that they're now recommending that we can use amoxyl or penicillin once or even twice daily. Should we be generalising this to other illnesses? Uh, no, I think that that's quite specific about eradication of group A strep um, in the throat. Uh, we know that once a day amoxyl will work there, um, but it's not okay to use once daily amoxicillin for otitis media, for example, other conditions. So I wouldn't think it's generalisable at all. Are there any risk factors or environmental issues that we should consider mm. when we prescribe antibiotics? We should think hard about children who are very young, who are at greater risk of uh, bacterial infections, and we should also think about those that are otherwise high risk. Maybe they have other medical conditions or they're in a socially deprived situation. So you're thinking things like cystic fibrosis. What yeah. about asthma? Well, I think asthma, we really need to remember that if they've got asthma, it's asthma that you need to treat. So I don't think you should be jumping in with antibiotics there. With less antibiotic prescribing, there may be more pressure to look at over-the-counter medications in children. Do they actually work? Let's start with nasal decongestants and cough suppressants. Hmm. Now, parents will often have had some experience themselves of using those, and maybe they have found them beneficial. But the evidence is not there that they work in children. And what's more, they have a lot of side effects. Uh, the decongestants can cause drowsiness, agitation, sometimes hallucinations. Cough suppressants, uh, well, they're clearly the wrong thing to give because a cough is a normal response to a lower respiratory tract infection and you don't want to suppress that. So we don't recommend those. What about vapour rubs and inhalations? There is, there is some evidence that they may be of benefit. They're quite irritant to the skin. So you need to be conscious of that. So it's something that can be tried. Vitamin C. Yeah, vitamin C, echinacea. Now, interestingly, there is a little bit of evidence that they may work. Now, it's hard to absolutely wholeheartedly recommend those, but there's a lot more evidence that they might work than antibiotics in the situation of most respiratory infections. Is there any concern about side effects with vitamin C in echinacea? Well, with vitamin C, no, not really. Echinacea can theoretically give you a rash at a slightly higher rate than you might have otherwise. But it is something that can be considered if you really feel you need to give something. I have to say I'm getting increasingly confused about the use of paracetamol and, and fever and infection in children. Can you clarify what we should be doing? And I think you're talking, Di, about whether we should be trying to get rid of fevers or not. Yes. Okay. And I think if you have a very high fever, you know, 39 plus, then yes, you can consider that. Okay. But also, paracetamol does actually help, if you're feeling miserable, to make you feel a little bit better. It works centrally to do that. So it has a role there. Is there any harm in using paracetamol in children? 
Generally not. Let's move on and look at the different respiratory illnesses in children. Emma, I'd like to start with the ears. How should we be managing otitis media? I think at acute otitis media infections, again, you want to think about the children that are at risk of complications. And we know that the children with an acute ear infection who are under two years um, with bilateral ear disease or with otorrhea, so discharging ears, uh, are more likely to need antibiotics than other ones that we might re recommend an antibiotic. Other than that, many can be triggered by respiratory tract infection or viral infections, so don't need antibiotic treatment uh, and will recover uneventfully after three to four days. And using simple analgesia is the way to manage those. One of the things that I've noticed in my own practice over the years, and I think people struggle with this, is you have a child in front of you that for whatever reasons you're thinking, boy, it might be really nice to give them antibiotics and you might just see a bit of a pink ear and it's tempting, that soft otitis media diagnosis. You know, I mean, most of these kids, they do not need antibiotics and I think we need to r restrain ourselves and resist the temptation to think, aha, I've got a justification, let me give some antibiotics because most of these kids will be fine in a day or two. In those children that we are going to prescribe antibiotics, what should we use and at what dose? So for acute otitis media, amoxicillin is the antibiotic to use. The dosing is 50 milligram per kilo per day divided three times. Um, for children who are at a slightly higher risk of carrying resistant organisms, they may have had multiple antibiotic courses, uh, or when you know there's middle ear fluid, you can use up to 90 milligram per kilo per day divided three times to penetrate the middle ear fluid. So that higher dose that you're talking about is really used only in otitis media with those higher risk patients? Yes, the children that have got middle ear fluid um, where we know the penetration is poor, who also might be carrying more resistant bugs because they've had repeated courses or long childcare exposures. It doesn't apply for the dosing of amoxicillin across the board. A child who has chronic suppurative otitis media, how should we be managing that? Uh, so that's, um, people may call chronic suppurative otitis media, glue ear. And that's more about persistence of middle ear fluid. Um, these children don't require antibiotics. They need other kinds of management, whether it be referral for um, ventilation tubes or grommet insertion. So those with discharging ears would need ear drops and oral toilet. The commonest thing we see, Stephen, is the common cold or the upper respiratory tract infection. How should we manage these? Well, the first thing to say is that it's very common. And in preschoolers, they will get several of these in a year, very commonly. It's not unusual to get half a dozen of these. And they're viral, and it doesn't help to treat them with antibiotics. And there's good evidence that antibiotics do not help in this situation. And what's more, they have side effects. And so it's a very good idea to avoid them. What about the child who comes in with greeny, yellow mucus discharge from their nose? Again, these are almost always viral and they don't need antibiotics. Now the only exception to that would be if the child was significantly systemically unwell. For instance, they have a very high fever. Sinusitis. It's uncommon in children, particularly in preschool children, because it takes quite a while for the sinuses to actually develop. Generally, it is viral still. Uh, and we generally wouldn't recommend treating with antibiotics. But again, the exception being that if it's prolonged and if there is significant systemic unwellness with that. Would you ever use steroids with an antibiotic in a systemically unwell child? No, wouldn't do that. Uh, but would, of course, want to give them good analgesia. Pharyngitis continues to be a problem in New Zealand. How should we manage this clinically in our practice? Uh, I still think of it sore throats about the sequelae of rheumatic fever, the consequences for New Zealand, the high risk and low risk population. I mean, clearly there's some children that will clinically have a nasty tonsillitis. They warrant at least a throat swab in, con in consideration of antibiotics. But importantly, we don't want to miss the high risk group who have a sore throat. That is children aged from at the age of three up to 35 year olds who are Māori and Pacific or from areas of socioeconomic deprivation they need to have a throat swab to look for group A strep and then treatment or immediate treatment if you're not going to have the opportunity to manage them or see them again. So to re-clarify, in patients or children with sore throat 
in high risk groups, we should uh, we should be taking a swab and treating if you think they won't come back or it's going to be hard to access or talk, talk with them later or take the swab and uh, give a back pocket prescription and ask them to start the antibiotics. Stephen, in a low risk child who comes in with sore throat, enlarged glands, fever over 38.5, white exudate on tonsils, how should we treat that group? This is a low risk group, and the vast majority of these are still viral. Now that child that you describe, uh, significantly systemically unwell, you can consider a script uh, either to start then or to have in the back pocket, but you should take a swab and you make sure to follow up that swab. If it's negative, you stop those antibiotics. One of the conditions that really distresses parents is having a young child with croup or laryngitis. How should we manage them? It is common, and these children uh, almost always have a viral infection. Parainfluenza virus is very common, commonly a cause of this. Antibiotics don't work for this, so we should avoid them. Uh, you can, of course, consider whether steroids are indicated, though. Parents often ask, are there other things we can do? Should we take our child into a steamy bathroom or take them outside into cold air? What should we recommend? There are a lot of things that people think about and that they try and there's contradictory advice out there and I think that's confusing. Uh, the most important thing is to keep them as happy and calm as possible. What should we prescribe and at what dose? Well, you can use prednisolone or dexamethasone. It's probably the most practical to prescribe prednisolone, one milligram per kilogram, two days. What about whooping cough? How does that present and who should we worry about? So whooping cough is a disease that's different in different age groups. For the under one year old and the under six month, it's a very dangerous and life-threatening condition, maybe with no cough, just sudden periods of stopping breathing or having blue spells and are the infants that we need to manage in hospital, sometimes for prolonged periods. So any stop breathing spell or blue spell or apnea is a could be a suspicion of a whooping cough uh, in an un one under one year old. For the older child who's been immunized, they may have a cough that's prolonged, but they may not have the classic whoop any longer because the disease is slightly mod modified by vaccination. But I think for a child that you suspect has whooping cough, that's a prolonged cough, you want to know about the diagnosis and that is using the nasopharyngeal swab and test for PCR because you want to know about their contacts. Are there at-risk children in the household, the under ones? Are there pregnant women or newborns? Uh, so that, that's important to know the diagnosis in those children with the prolonged cough. Is there any place in starting erythromycin early in a child that you suspect may have whooping cough? So antibiotics are important to stop the infectiousness of whooping cough. But unfortunately, once you have the disease, you will continue to cough. Antibiotics don't change the course of the illness. So yes, there is important aspects to prevent infectiousness. So giving antibiotics erythromycin or azithromycin in a younger child are important. Recently, we have started to talk about cocooning or protecting those at risk of whooping cough. What does this mean? So that's really referring to vaccination uh, or cocooning, ring fencing vaccination around the most vulnerable, and that's the under ones and the newborns. So we use the vaccine in pregnancy, and we use the vaccination in adults who live in a household for a newborn, and vaccination in healthcare workers to prevent them from exposing young infants uh, who aren't completely protected by vaccination. What about the situation when we have a child who comes in with a, a productive cough a little bit of wheeze and fever. In the past, I would have called these an acute bronchitis. How should we diagnose this and what is it? Well, I think that that diagnosis is, a, people argue about that diagnosis. Uh, in some ways, it's a pathological description, some inflammation of the bronchi. Uh, but that child that you describe, it's really important to work out what are you dealing with? And a lot of those children, they will have asthma. And it's important to treat asthma if that's what's going on. So that'd be the first thing to say. 
The next thing to say would be that the vast majority of these are viral and we don't have good evidence that antibiotics helps them. So what about those children who you suspect may have a pneumonia? Well, those ones need careful thinking about. Now, it's worthwhile keeping in mind the World Health Organization's guidelines for diagnosing pneumonia clinically. They are actually very useful, even in a context like New Zealand. The things that make you concerned are a child having obviously cough or difficulty breathing with an increased respiratory rate for age or lower chest wall in drawing, so difficulty breathing. Or if they've got a low oxygen saturation, you check your pulse oximetry and that's low. What's low? Well, certainly below 93% would be a concern. Now, in those children, you are on firm ground treating them with antibiotics. The children who are not in that category, you're not on firm ground, and there isn't good evidence that antibiotics help. For those that we are going to give antibiotics to, should we do a chest X-ray? Generally, it doesn't help. And I would say about those children that you look at and think, hmm, you're meeting criteria for pneumonia here, have a careful look at them. If their oxygen is low, if they're having difficulty drinking, uh, if they're otherwise looking septic and unwell, you need to actually refer them to get into hospital. So how should we treat the children that we suspect have pneumonia? Amoxicillin is still a very good antibiotic for this. 90 milligrams per kilogram per day, divided into three doses for five days is a good way to go. Respiratory conditions are common in children, particularly in winter. Do you have any tips that you would like to leave with us with today? Uh, I think that we should really seriously consider the influenza vaccine each season, especially for children aged under five who you know have had any respiratory illness, whether it be asthma or presentations to doctors or hospitals. They have a funded flu vaccine each season, and that's a top tip from me. Stephen. A couple of things come to mind. One is it's really important to frame this up for families. Viral infections, respiratory infections are very common. They will last for a while. They don't need antibiotics and antibiotics can cause side effects. It's helpful to frame that up. You need to though, you need to do something for them. So, so treating with paracetamol or other analgesics, other supportive treatments, you know, if those are going to help, I think it's really helpful to give something. The other thing to say is that uh, if you find yourself backed into a corner, then blame the paediatricians and blame the Ministry of Health, because we really need to get on top of this overprescribing issue. Thank you, Stephen and Emma. There have been so many issues raised today. Respiratory illnesses in children is really bread and butter of general practice. For us to feel confident in our diagnoses and to feel confident in limiting the prescribing of antibiotics is really important.